Good afternoon. I'm Eddie Morse. I'm a rector of IHC Delft, and I'm sitting here together with uh, Guy Allerts. And um, I'm hoping that uh, I reach a lot of people. I'm quite curious in which time zone you're sitting in. Uh, so I would like to wish you all a very good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening. Um, here in the Netherlands, we're in uh, the middle at noon. And um, with this, this uh, very short uh, introduction to the symposium called From Capacity Development to Implementation Science, which is the sixth uh, symposium on the topic of capacity development in a period of 30 years. So this symposium is given every five years. And uh, one of the first things we would like to do is to have a reflection actually on those uh, 30 years. But before we do that, I would like to give the floor to our tech host, which is uh, Anna, because she will explain a little bit about how you can engage with us uh, during this session. Please, Anna. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, during this session, for all the audience joining in from everywhere in the world, thank you. Um, you will be able to engage, as I mentioned in an earlier message in the chat, um, by talking to the others on the right-hand side of the screen, where there's the chat box. You also have find some handout instructions on how you can engage before and after the webinar attached to this uh, session itself. And I would like to add that there will be some polls coming up during the session um, and a Q&A. During the designated time of Q&A is when you will be able to ask direct questions to the speakers. Thank you, Eddie. Back to you. Okay, thank you, Anna. Um, could you please uh, put the first slide uh, on the screen? Uh, what I would like to do in uh, the upcoming uh, presentation is to explain a little bit about the total symposium. And uh, I also would like to let you know that uh, organizing a symposium like this online is quite a challenge. And uh, I also know that a lot of other organizations are also looking forward to see how you can do this. So in that sense, this symposium is also an example, a learning example on how we can improve uh, things. And um, by that, it would also be very welcome that in the case that you have your own experience that you can share that with us so we can uh, develop uh, the way how we're managing having symposia uh, in a session like this in the future. If uh, you look at uh, the symposium and you have had the opportunity uh, to go through the program, you will see that the symposium is composed from uh, different parts. One part is uh, the keynotes that will be given there. Another part uh, consists uh, of uh, the different uh, tracks. So there are eight official tracks within the program. And the topics of uh, these tracks, uh, they differ. Uh, they switch uh, from an introductory program on implementation science towards uh, how we can arrange financing, but also uh, to uh, how we can use uh, big data. If um, you are uh, interested to follow those tracks, please uh, feel free to have a look at the program and join them. It can be done in different ways. One is actively during the, the webinars or the video conferences, but another one uh, could also be uh, that uh, you can have an uh, engagement uh, just by watching the taped uh, webinars. Uh, so if you're in a time zone or if you're occupied with your work and not able to follow uh, the present presentations uh, at the moment, you can always do that at a later stage. This is also important for the chat box uh, because we will keep the questions that you're asking there and we will also post those questions, which um, allows us actually to help uh, giving a um, representation, but also answers actually from the dis different participants in there. And while uh, we're uh, waiting actually a little bit for uh, the presentation uh, coming on the screen. I would like to pose a question uh, to Guy, if I'm allowed. And um, I think that uh, in the presentation that Guy already uploaded on the, the portal of the symposium, and I hope that uh, a number of you have been able to follow that, uh, Guy uh, also discusses a conceptual model of capacity planning. And in that um, 
capacity planning model, you indicated that in a large number of cases, uh, the capacity planning is well written down in reports, but not really transferred into actions on the ground. So based on your experience, what would you consider as the main step forward that should be taken to progress capacity development in the water sector? Uh, thank you, Eddie, and uh, hello to all of you. Um, yeah, that's a very uh, fundamental and uh, challenging question. So why uh, is it still so difficult to have capacity development in uh, investment programs or in the budgets of organizations? What I think we should be doing um, is perhaps uh, three things. Um, and, and the first thing has to do with the uh, observation that um, uh, capacity development is by definition uh, fuzzy. It is a bit, it's also something that takes place over longer times. So many years before people have absorbed, have um, embedded no, new knowledge, have experimented with new approaches. That takes time. And uh, notably, parliaments, uh, parliaments that uh, approve budgets or bosses or the taxpayer uh, would like to see quick results and also likes to use metrics to uh, see progress as expressed in, for example, kilometers of pipes uh, in the ground or the number of new clients um, for the water supply company. Uh, for irrigation, etc. So we have to do more advocacy. I think that's one important um, step. We have to emphasize that uh, working on the future of capacity development is to the strength and takes time. And those who approve budgets and monitor the implementation have to understand that. Secondly, uh, we have also to become better at uh, demonstrating the value of capacity development. So we can, it's not enough to say, oh, people will know better what to do. Uh, we have to be more specific, more concrete. Uh, so the, the, the measure, measuring tools uh, to demonstrate the impact that capacity is making have to become more, uh, more sophisticated, have to become more telling uh, to, the, um, to those who make decisions and decide on budgets. Uh, perhaps a, a final thing, Eddie, is um, that um, uh, I would think that, and it's very actionable, that universities and institutes of higher learning, um, research institutes, um, educational establishments in general have to come out of their uh, ivory tower and they have to become also more um, oriented towards problem, sol problem solving. Uh, and that is more messy, that's more complicated. They have to then also work with, they have to partner with uh, organizations in the real world, uh, in, uh, you know, in government, in civil society. Uh, so that requires that universities, uh, universe, uh, establishments of higher learning, they have to become also more able to, uh, to fulfill that role. I think these are three uh, important steps uh, to, uh, that we have to keep working on. Okay, uh, thank you, Guy. And um, just to continue a little bit on that, is uh, in, in your, again, your extensive uh, presentation that uh, can be found on, on the portal, you also mentioned the 10, 20, and 70 percent rule. And um, what, what um, if I understand it correctly, what you mean by that is that 10% uh, you will learn uh, in, in the classroom, 20% by mimicking, uh, and 70% by your own experience. And uh, you just mentioned also the role of universities in there, but, but do you think that those percentage are static or do you think that they change during somebody's career? Yeah, that's a very good observation. Uh, in my presentation that no doubt all of you have already uh, watched, uh, I, I do refer to that uh, important um, observation. Um, it, it is not a static thing. And uh, I also mentioned in that presentation that that was based on a survey that was done in the 80s uh, when uh, managers in, in organizations were interviewed. And uh, so the question was, where do, did they get their uh, information and knowledge from? Uh, and, and for that purpose, that is a very reasonable, uh, you know, uh, ratio. Um, but definitely, if you are a young kid, uh, 
school training, uh, education uh, in school is also um, is also um, is it perhaps much more important than the ten percent because the school education uh, teaches you how to learn. It teaches you as a young person how to uh, observe, identify, uh, and appreciate edu uh, knowledge, and how to um, how to accommodate that knowledge in your own behavior. So, learning how to uh, how to learn is uh, is a very crucial element in our life, and that is done primarily when we are young. At school, school is a very crucial uh, element in that uh, process. Um, so the 10, 20, 70 is a very uh, helpful uh, concept. Uh, but yes, so that's more at the level of professionals. Mm -hmm. and, and for young people, things are different. The important is we have to have a, we have to, to acquire a frame, a mind frame on how we should be learning. That is the fundament. Uh, of, of all. So if I understand you correctly, uh, Guy, that uh, you're also saying that uh, even if you're very experienced in the end, it's still good uh, to also uh, make sure that you sometimes pay attention to this 10% uh, so that you can again increase actually the knowledge that uh, you, you uh, may use in your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, work. Yes, absolutely. And the 10% of uh, classroom teaching is actually uh, crucial also to when it, and it is very valuable when it comes at a precise time, right? Because then it can help to uh, up to to interpret what we have learned through experience in the seventy percent, and it can help us to get ready for the uh, for the mimicking and for the other learning modalities that we as humans uh, possess. And Guy, uh, if uh, you uh, then. Uh, again, uh, I, I took that from your uh, presentation there. You also distinguish actually capacity development not only as teaching, as teaching in the classroom, uh, but you also look at the capacity development at uh, four different levels. Could you say a few words about those different levels? Uh, yes, sure. Um, uh, that's one of the things that we in our water sector have learned over the past uh, three decades uh, in all the, in all the Dialogues that took place um, uh, in the uh, in the symposia, <clears throat> and that is the recognition that um, the knowledge mm -hmm. and so the capacity to act is uh, present in the mind uh, of individuals, of a professional or a scientist or a NGO um, a staff member, or indeed as uh, uh, the knowledge that a household mother possesses when she teaches her children to take care of, of, uh, of sanitary measures, of washing hands to start with. So each individual has knowledge and we have to know that and have to work with that, uh, that, that, uh, that recognition. Uh, secondly, you know, many people together make an organization. Um, so organizations are necessary as, you know, ministries or water utility or university. Um, and so together, uh, a good organization adds value over and beyond the knowledge that each individual contributes. So the way the organization is structured, how it is managed, is crucial to, um, to add this value and make the organization indeed um, performing uh, effective in its, uh, in, its, in its operations. And many organizations together then make you know, the water sector, the, you know, the, what we call the enabling environment. And indeed, um, so the regulatory systems, the regulators, um, so the ministers, um, the uh, associations of water utilities, uh, also the fiscal system can be very crucial in making sure that uh, water investments are done properly. So all, also at that level, also at that level, the, um, uh, enabling environment is uh, uh, indeed uh, representing a body of knowledge, and we as capacity developers will have to work on that. And then finally, uh, the enabling environment operates in society. And so, and as I mentioned already in the beginning, uh, the house, uh, the, the, the mother in the house, uh, the father 
but also the, the taxpayer, uh, the um, person who uses or spills water, who votes, uh, all that, all these uh, communities have to have knowledge and have to be knowledgeable about how to uh, decide on and work together for a sustainable future. So we have to work on these four levels. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Guy. And um, I'm going to challenge our tech hosts a little bit uh, because I'm going to uh, defer a little bit from an agreed schedule that we had uh, with her. So let, let's see if she's able to follow us. Uh, so Anna, uh, is it possible uh, for you actually to put up uh, the slides uh, introducing the symposium with the, the different tracks? Let me see if I can open them this time. So just give us a minute to... So I'm now starting to share the screen. And let me know when you are able to see it. I see the screen. And could you move up to the first slide, uh, Anna? Yes. So, um, okay, can you go further up to this? Yes, thank you. And I, I would like, uh, yeah. I will briefly, I explained this already to the public, so I will uh, run through them. Maybe you could click once. Yes, this is what I said, that we have those nine different tracks here with all the different issues there. I already mentioned water financing and big data. So please uh, join uh, any of the, the tracks or have a look at uh, the webinars if uh, they are taped. But besides the tracks, uh, we also have uh, two panel discussions. Uh, one on capacity for change management and transition, and one accelerating South-South collaboration. Uh, the third uh, important part is on the next slide, Anna, if you can go there. Uh, our uh, nine keynote uh, speeches from the, the webinar. And uh, I just pick up some of them. Uh, one of them is a very practical one from the case of Sudan. That's the third bullet point. And we also will look a little bit at other issues uh, like uh, uh, the presentation from Charles Force Marty towards water security. And uh, we're looking at uh, the Global Sanitation Graduate School Partnership from Damir. Uh, so there's a, quite a big uh, mixture in the keynotes. So we hope you can also join those. And then uh, the next component of uh, the symposium. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Tona? is the uh, two main outputs and there i would like to ask your attention for so what we hope to get out of the symposium at the end with your contributions in there is first of all uh, the what we call the delft agenda um, that will be constructed actually from uh, the different uh, topics that i just mentioned to you and your participation and will be discussed by a high level panel uh, on the 4th of june so i would like to invite you to also join that uh, and have a look at that uh, webinar uh, when we will have that and uh, see what they are going to say about our agenda that we're going to propose to them. And the second output uh, of the symposium will be a report. And for that, uh, we will send around the draft, again, based on your inputs, uh, for your comments. And we'll try to finalize that by middle of uh, July. So, Anna, can you go to the next slide? Um, for all the sessions, we have an approach in mind and uh, we use three steps there. And the reasoning behind that is uh, the first step. What is the technical problem? So, for example, in the drink water utilities, if you have no budget, how can you expand your network? And the second step is what capability needs to be strengthened in the institution? So, how can you engage with customers to raise income? Is that by water pricing or is that in another way that you can overcome this technical problem and the third one is uh, how can we develop this uh, capability uh, what process do we need what instruments do we need and i was now just giving an example of a technical problem but of course that could also be a social problem or a governance problem uh, but this is the sort of sequence that we think will help to develop this agenda next slide please 
Um, with that, uh, I would like uh, to uh, ask uh, Anna as well uh, to start up the, the video from uh, Bas Bovolbrecht, uh, who is the deputy major for the city of Delft. And while Anna is starting this message, uh, we think it's still nice that uh, you're welcomed here. And uh, we hope that uh, one day you will also be able to join us in live. Uh, which is one of the things that Bas will also invite you to do. Uh, but for the time being, uh, I think he has some nice work to share with you on uh, the video. My name is Bas Vollebrecht and as a deputy mayor for the city of Delft, it's an honor for me to welcome you digitally to the sixth conference of IHE on uh, from water capacity development to implementation science. And normally it would be of an honor and a pleasure for me to welcome you physically in our beautiful city hall that you see behind me. At the moment I can only invite you to visit our city at a later moment. We would be pleased and honored to welcome you. And I hope that when you visit our city you discover that Delft is a truly unique combination of history and technology. Our history is very visible here in our inner city with the city hall originally dating from 13th century but also uh, through our close connections to the royal family of the Netherlands. Um, William of Orange, the forefather of our nation, lived in Delft and unfortunately also was killed here in Delft. Uh, but also from our close ties to, of course, Delft Blue, an innovative way of making porcelain and famous Dutch painters as Johannes Vermeer and Pieter de Hoog. And also on our technology side, our history is rich. The first microscope was invented here in Delft a few centuries ago. Wi-Fi was discovered here in Delft a few decades ago and also in the current state of time we are uh, on the forefront of a few fields in, uh, in a lot of different uh, sides of science. Quantum mechanics for example but also in your field of interest water management. We are uh, host to a few unique institutions like of course IHE but also TNO, Deltares and of course the TU Delft which provide us in a unique role. When there's a truly wicked, complex problem on the field of water management, governments, national, but also international, come to Delft for advice. And what we need at such times as a policymaker is not only knowledge, we also need our experts to advise us on how to cope with different strategies, how to cope with different interests. And I hope that the program that is in a truly remarkable way put in an extremely fast way, totally online, uh, which I truly respect and compliment the organizing committee for. I hope that this program helps you to become such an expert, an expert that not only have the knowledge to advise us as policymakers, but also have the knowledge to implement the necessary solutions to tackle the big problems that we are going to face. I think that the current corona, uh, the COVID uh, situation um, brings a big challenge. I mentioned the total transference for this conference to an online uh, setting, which is truly remarkable. But I also hope that we will be able to transfer it into a chance that we see it as a start for an online community of all kinds of water experts, experts, uh, scientists, policy makers to bring more of those different disciplines together and create a strong group that is able to face the big challenges of the field of water management that we have to tackle as a world in unity. Again, I wish you a lot of pleasure at uh, the, common, uh, the, the coming conference, at the coming days, and uh, it would be an honor to welcome you to our beautiful city at a later moment. Thank you. Wait. You can start again. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bas, also for this uh, open invitation for everybody to come and join us uh, later on, uh, hopefully this year and otherwise next year here in Delft. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to present you just a few slides uh, on uh, setting the scene. So uh, I would again ask Anna if she could open uh, the PowerPoint to the presentation. And... Um, Maybe you can go, yes, can you go to the next slide? So uh, this is a slide actually coming from uh, the latest World Economic Forum uh, report from 2020. And what it shows to you actually on the vertical axis is uh, the impact and on the horizontal axis, the likelihood of potential crisis that may happen. And as you can see uh, up to the, the right-hand uh, corner, 
uh, all of them are related uh, to natural disasters, almost all of them, uh, with the exception maybe from cyber attacks and human-made environmental disasters. But um, all of them are also linked to water, and uh, water crisis itself is also there, uh, but also climate action failure uh, will have its impact on the environment. Uh, so the water sector is, is under stress. Uh, one that uh, I think uh, may uh, increase in coming time is uh, those, those natural disasters, but also I think in the present period that we're in are the infectious diseases, which you see on the left-hand side of uh, this corner. And I think that will uh, move uh, to the right uh, and maybe also upwards, both in impact and likelihood after the experience we had with COVID-19. Can you go to the next slide? Um, and uh, to uh, another thing that keeps on changing is, uh, of course, uh, the temperature rise that we're seeing. Uh, maybe we'll have some positive impacts of the coronavirus because of the emissions that went down. But as soon as the economy, if that will start in the same way, uh, we will see an increase in emissions again. So a challenge uh, for us, uh, both from the water sector but other sectors, is how can we make a difference and how can we assure that we have a world and organize ourselves, have a society that accommodates uh, those uh, changes and helps us actually to achieve a reduction of uh, temperature increase and carbon emissions and have uh, water available for everybody on the globe. Can you go to the next slide, Anna? Um, if you look at that, and we'll come back to those questions, you see quite often, and I here have the example of the synthesis report from SDG 6 for water and sanitation. Please move to the next slide, Anna. You see in this uh, report that um, capacity development is uh, quite an urgent issue. This is a slide showing some of the 10 main goals coming out of this report. And what it says is only limited progress can be made and any investment is at risk without developing the necessary long-term human and institutional capacity. Which was also what Guy was mentioning when we were having uh, our short discussion before. And you will see that this will come back later on. Could you move to the next slide? Other issues where you also see the same issue mentioned here is, uh, for example, from the SDG 17. Strengthening the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. And you see that in target 17.9, capacity development is mentioned as well. What uh, I noticed in the presentation from Claudia Paul Wesel during the Budapest Water Summit from last year, uh, she also mentions that implementation is the bottleneck actually in improving the governance in the water sector. And she was giving an example of South Africa. What I wanted to state with these slides is that Often capacity development is uh, mentioned, it's needed, uh, but not so often uh, you see how that then should be done. And also one of the questions that are already shown by the public here, by Thea, was how do you finance that? So we'll come back to the discussion later on. And can you move to the next uh, slide, Anna? So this is uh, actually where I would like to invite uh, Guy, uh, who is professor here at IHC Delft, has been working for the World Bank uh, Meanwhile, and um, before that, again, he was a professor at IG Delft. He switched uh, topics slightly, going a little bit from a more environmental engineering uh, towards uh, what uh, capacity development is doing. So please, Guy, could you explain briefly what uh, you have seen happening in capacity development over the last 30 years? Uh, right. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I argued in, in, in my presentation that um, we as water specialists are very good at analyzing the physics of water or water surfaces, but we are much less familiar with um, uh, understanding how institutions function, and even less uh, familiar with uh, you know how then can we strengthen, improve the performance of institutions. Uh, so uh, in this uh, slide that you should now have on your screen. So you see on, on the left-hand side, we, we know there's a problem, it's articulated, we know what should be done. We always talk about what should be done, what the government should do, preferably. And then on the right-hand side, okay, there the problem is solved. That is the intuitive approach. Next, Anna, thank you. So, but we forget uh, that in developing, but also in rich countries, that there are implementing institutions in the middle. So they have to, uh, go from the left to the right, they have to do it. They are composed of 
the spark of their operational practices and protocols and their management style. Next, and uh, so the development of capacities and precisely how we can interact with these implementing institutions by developing, disseminating, and then making sure that knowledge is getting absorbed in these institutions. So we educate individuals, but also look at how the institutions perform. Uh, so uh, why is that necessary? Well, in the rich and the poorer countries, we face the same uh, challenges. Next, um, uh, next, please. So first of all, there's more complexity because there are more regulations, environmental regulations, for example, that are necessary. There's also a need for more integration of uh, disciplines and approaches. We need to work also much more intensively with local governments, NGOs, communities, etc. Next one. Uh, it's also that we have to face a continuous but also a very rapid change in our working environment. <clears throat> Next week. And um, that also pertains, of course, to climate change, but also demographic uh, developments. Uh, and so that leads to more uncertainty because it's more difficult to predict what is going to happen in 10 years or 20 years from now. And we have to invest now. We make the, have to make the decisions to invest at this moment. Next, please. So that means that as professionals or scientists or whatever, as organizations, as communities, we must keep learning to adapt to this. Next, please. So let's now look at the, um, uh, the you know, what that would mean. So I already uh, talked about the four levels. So we have the individual level. Uh, in, individuals have to be educated, trained. Um, secondly, the organizational level, because many individuals make up an organization. We have also procedures, and, you know, operational practices, human capital, and then they operate in this enabling environment that has rules and uh, staff and capacity. Um, and then finally, they operate in the community and society that also has culture, behavior, and capacity indeed. Next one. So what does that mean for organizations? Um, in, the, in my presentation, I elaborate a bit more on this. So first of all, there must be acceptance to learn. So if we, if an organization, if the uh, water utility feels they are doing already a perfect job, you know, then there's no point in, in, in learning, right? So, and how to understand, you know, what can be improved for some monitoring and even in the evaluations or framework is a, a very helpful tool for that. Thirdly, clearly technical training, uh, be it on engineering or be it on accounting or on, uh, communication with um, with uh, the, uh, the the customers of the utility. So these are technical trainings. Fourthly, they're also higher level aggregate non-cognitive skills and attitudes like leadership or teamwork uh, that are necessary to be um, to be uh, strengthened. Fifthly, an organization can structure itself, can organize experiential learning through what it is uh, going to do, and it can learn the lessons, so it becomes a learning organization. Uh, the sixth point is the partnership. That's a very useful way to engage with peers, with uh, colleagues, and learn from them. Seventhly, an organization different from an individual has a human resources management, so the boss can decide on which skills, which expertise to attract, to recruit, and how to motivate staff uh, to uh, do a better job. And finally, it's also a matter of process. And I refer to work by Pritchett, who is also talking uh, later in the symposium on the pro problem driven iterative adaptation. So it's a system of doing, sorry, learning by doing. <laughs> so whilst we do, you also learn and you incorporate lessons uh, stepwise. And that helps us to build implementation capacity and ensures for the delivery. Um, and I think that's the one. That was my last one. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you very much, uh, Guy. And uh, before uh, uh, coming back uh, to you, I would like to ask uh, Anna if uh, she could uh, put on the slide explaining a little bit to the public how they can post questions. Yes. So now it's up. Um, I will. Should I also write it in the chat, Eddie? Uh, yes, please. So.
So if uh, you look at the uh, chat box, uh, Anna will put a message there, how you can ask the questions and she will open the, the chat box. So uh, you are asked actually to um, have uh, a couple of questions there. We're trying to do it in blocks of five questions and see what uh, we can then answer. And then we switch to the next block of uh, five questions. But before we do that, I would also like uh, Anna, while you can post the question, so please go ahead with that, uh, to open the first poll, because um, I would like to find out a little bit uh, about how you think about some of the issues that uh, Guy was just um, presenting. So the first uh, poll question is, um, what do you consider the main success factor for implementation of innovations? And Anna, while you're putting up uh, the poll. Yes, so, so the poll is now above the chat and uh, ready and open for participation of the audience. So, okay, while uh, you fill in uh, the poll, I, I would like to ask one more question to uh, Guy, if I'm allowed. Um, and that is that uh, one of the first questions actually that popped up when we started uh, the, the session here uh, was, uh, okay, we agree, uh, capacity development, uh, we need that, but, but how, how do we finance, uh, finance that? And how can we speed it up? So where do we get the financing from uh, that helps us to speed up capacity development on top actually of the present ongoing capacity development? Uh, right, that is uh, the, um, uh, the the most fundamental question, I suppose. Um, and um, we have to think, uh, you know, in, in some more depth about this. Uh, so maybe some of you may have already uh, suggestions for that. Um, but what I would um, certainly um, recommend is that we engage more intensively with uh, uh, those agencies that have the money. And so that means, for example, when we talk about water, uh, multilateral banks, so ADB, World Bank, uh, African Development Bank, these are major players. Um, they finance uh, in their finance programs, uh, not only infrastructure, but also other programs. And um, it's important that they also uh, are very um, uh, aware of the importance of uh, capacity development. And as a matter of fact, uh, many of these banks, they feel that it's important, uh, but it's always then a trade-off, you know, are you going to put 10 million in, you know, more in the capacity development, or are we going to use that 10 million to have another thousand uh, stack points in the water supply system that we are financing? So that kind of trade-off is a, a very difficult one. But uh, yes, so I, I would recommend that we, uh, we, we uh, ratchet up, ratchet up the uh, conversation with uh, these uh, agencies to make sure that uh, enough uh, funding for capacity development um, activities is being secured. Now that said, uh, from my own experience, um, from my own experience, uh, I also know that sometimes these development banks in a program investment they recommend to have more training of local governments or farmers um, but uh, the ministers of finance who are the ones who have to you know agree on the on the loan uh, or even on the grant they they uh, are reluctant and they say no we already know this you know we only want the money from the uh, bank uh, for the investment, because that's something that we can demonstrate, that's something we can show. And again, that is what I talked about in the beginning. There is this kind of um, natural uh, natural inclination to first look at the physical, uh, physical products that come out of a program or a project. So that, I think, is a um, uh, quite a challenge. So it means that we have to do the advocacy uh, using the metrics to demonstrate that investing in capacity development makes good sense makes economic sense makes financial sense um, the second one 
uh, I would recommend is that we have to become smarter at how we organize um, sectoral programs or research programs and that we have much more uh, thought about how to uh, how to, to how to design such a program to make it more adapt adaptable uh, to make it more iterative uh, so that we have also a, a, a explicit learning pro process in the implementation of that uh, program so i think these are the two elements but i don't think it makes much sense to go to the minister and say i need uh, 10 million because i'm going to do capacity development it only works well if it is part of a implementation program. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Guy. And um, while, while you've been asking the questions, then uh, we have also seen uh, your reactions actually to uh, the poll. And uh, what we see from there is that uh, uh, yeah, the, the one that you selected most was culture and willingness as being a main success factor for implementation of innovations. And uh, the second one following that is uh, governance with 21%. Uh, there was also a question there asked by uh, Nadine uh, about why did we put uh, culture and willingness uh, together? Of course, uh, we could separate them as well. Um, but uh, willingness and culture sometimes are related uh, because uh, sometimes within a certain specific cultural setting, uh, it's, it's um, partly relates to willingness, but we could separate the two, but it gives a bit of a clue uh, where things are. Um, my main conclusion is that it's not a technical state. Yeah? So it's it's more about the more social sides, uh, especially the willingness that, that is there. And this is about uh, awareness raising. Um, while I would like to ask Anna to put up uh, the second poll, uh, I would also try to answer some of the questions that uh, came in. And one of the questions that came in, uh, the, uh, to you, I. You assure uh, that uh, women are also uh, taken up in uh, the process of capacity development in the water sector. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So um, women are the key actors when it comes to uh, water management and sanitation in the household and in the immediate uh, neighborhood. Um, I, I don't have a very immediate question. The first thing I want to would like to emphasize is that um, uh, each program or uh, activity on capacity development has to be site specific. It's case specific, and uh, so in in many cases, indeed, when you talk about sanitation or invest in water supply or uh, in in, in uh, water around the household. Uh, drain it, the women have a very crucial role to play. So there, uh, my assumption would be that it is uh, absolutely essential to make sure that a program, an investment, for example, would have mechanisms to get the um, uh, women involved. How to do that, we cannot elaborate on that here, but it is definitely an essential thing. On the other hand, when you have a project uh, or if the government has a intention to uh, bring water from A to B and or store water, um, then maybe that the, you, know, you cannot do everything. And so there may be a necessity to um, focus on other elements in capacity development for other target groups that may be deemed to be of more priority. Um, Thirdly, uh, uh, generically, uh, I believe that there is a, um, a generic uh, need for continuing capacity development, be it by the work of um, awareness raising in general by NGOs, for example, in rural communities, or the fact that uh, Discovery Panel is uh, broadcasting every week something about uh, water management and sanitation, etc. So there's also, these are also very important carriers or the, or the press. Um, so these, um, uh, these, these initiatives, these programs are very important. And yes, absolutely, women have to be a very definite uh, target audience, uh, not only as a way to, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to transfer knowledge, but primarily perhaps also as a way to 
get them involved in uh, in the in the debate. Uh, so that I think that would be um, my first um, five cents of wisdom uh, for this question, and I'm sure there's much more to be said about it. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. And then um, I'm looking at uh, the the chat box here, and uh, Diana is saying that it's important if you want to uh, assure innovation uptake that you look at Windows as opportunity for this uptake. And I think uh, I, I fully agree with that. Uh, it would be quite interesting if we could recognize those windows. So, so when do we see that? And when uh, should we uh, then push a certain innovation? Uh, so uh, feedback on those uh, would, would also be quite interesting. But maybe, Guy, in your huge experience, have you seen such windows? Or do you have uh, examples of when you have seen big windows of opportunity to push a certain innovation? Absolutely, and I think uh, Diana Torres is uh, clearly somebody who has uh, worked in, in practice <laughs> and, and it, it has experienced uh, firsthand that it is important to, um, uh, to, to be ready at the right moment. Uh, and indeed, it's, it's, uh, it's part of, the, um, of our expertise as capacity developers to, um, to, 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 to analyze when the moment has come to propose something concrete and to uh, engage with, you know, the government or local governments or the uh, or the NGOs or the community, so uh, it's very important to to do that because otherwise you're just uh, preaching against uh, you know the black wall, and um, uh, at the same time, just don't keep waiting until the window opens. Uh, chance prepare a uh, chance favors a prepared mind so if you are already ready with a program with a good proposal with a, a mechanism to get started uh, at the moment when there is the, no open window yet um then that does not mean it will never come it will come at some point there will be a reform program or there will be a change in the political atmosphere um, or there will be a new boss and then the program that you have in your mind that you have ready will then be picked up so uh, again it's important to start working as we speak now and not wait until the window opens but keep monitoring when windows may be open and if you are able to nudge that window a bit more open uh, the better so okay thank you very much Guy. then uh, maybe an, an, a question of uh, Richard Kimwaga is what is the threshold for capacity development? But I would like to ask Richard, could you elaborate a little bit on, on uh, what you mean by threshold? And then we can come back uh, to your question. Um, meanwhile, I would like uh, to pose a question to Guy again. Can you elaborate the ME to identify the weakness for organizations? Um, yes. Um, uh, Kali Thassan. And Eddie, um, uh, it, we don't know yet. We don't yet have a very um, robust uh, framework for monitoring evaluation when it comes to capacity. So that is perhaps point one. And, and the second point is that uh, again, uh, capacity development is a very case-specific, location-specific, time-specific. Um, thing and uh, so we should not try to to solve all the problems and build all the capacities at the same time that's not going to work um, so um, monitoring evaluation um, on the capacity on the capabilities is uh, should be wrapped into uh, a monitoring and evaluation uh, framework for a investment program for example or for a policy or a policy implementation program of a government or a, uh, the local municipality or utility uh, or an NGO um, and um, uh, so some of the indicators uh, that we can identify could be for example uh, how many you can do surveys for example we have uh, 20 municipalities that should be able to do something or to understand something so you can have a survey and, and check on whether they know how to do it you know well, you can also check whether uh, the municipalities have a protocol that reflects that knowledge, right? So if, um, if uh, you know, utilities or municipalities have to uh, generate income for a water service, 
uh, you can ask the professional, do you know what it means income generation and how you do that? And the professor, yes. But then look at how the municipality is organized, or utility is organized, and there's no protocol, no mechanism to make that happen and uh, to follow up on the income generation, then um, it's not going to work. So you have to um, you have to look at a different level, as I said, and tailor make it for the specific environment, specific question at hand. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Guy. And um, a, a question to the tech host, if you can help me to scroll down a little bit on the questions. But on the right hand side. But while. Um, Would I, should I close the poll, Eddie? Um, yes, uh, the, the first poll. You may open the second one if you like. The second one is open. Oh, oh I, I don't see the second one on my screen. Uh, the second one is uh, on the top of the chat. I can also display it in the middle of the screen if you like. Yes, if you could do that for a second, it would be nice to give some feedback there. Interesting for you. Thank yeah. You. And um, I'm coming back to the questions after that. So it's which level do you see the biggest need for capacity development? And here, uh, the, the fourth level that was described by Guy, communities and society is seen as the biggest one is 34 uh, percent and then um, I think the second one in there is an enabling environment and I think that's also uh, a little bit to do what we just discussed about those windows of opportunities and one of the remarks that was made also in the chat box about that was that uh, the donors or the funding agencies also play a big role in uh, the windows of uh, opportunities and um, I agree uh, to that. I think by that it's also quite important uh, that this engagement uh, from both sides with, uh, say, the, the, the public in general, uh, the, the communities, but also the donor organizations is quite important to help to create such a window of opportunity to um, see if a certain innovation can be uh, really outscaled to a large area. Um, um, I just pick up another question there uh, from the chat box, and that's where Alan is asking, uh, looking at the risk landscape of the World Economic Forum in light of coronavirus, is this a sign for lacking capacity in judging risks? Um, good question. Um, I think it's uh, the, the coronavirus was indeed uh, uh, maybe an unforeseen risk. Uh, the people who fill in the uh, questionnaire from the World Economic Forum is, is a very broad uh, public and actually they're not experts in viruses so I'm not 100% sure if uh, you could uh, blame them for doing that but at least the knowledge about uh, such uh, um, viruses is or at least was not well known to the broader public and I think that has changed now so I also assume that people will experience that differently. And um, what Ellen is saying about it is experts were uh, warning for uh, years about the pandemic, uh, but it seems political and business leaders not only misjudge the likelihood, but also the impact. I think you're right, uh, but I also think that uh, that is also maybe uh, the case with other crises that are also on the same figure, uh, that often um, maybe in, in, in an individual uh, communication, political, politi Politicians will acknowledge a certain risk, but then to translate that into actions, that's quite a difficult one. And how you can deal with that is, is not an easy one. And I think that's where a big challenge is also uh, for us, also on how we can develop capacity actually to acknowledge those risks, but also to see how you can then implement measures to adjust those risks. Then, um, a question on, on, on the financing side, what proportion of the operational budget of a nation should be set aside for capacity development? Uh, I must say that uh, I find that a very difficult question, uh, Guy. Do you have any experience or advice there? Um, no, no, I think that that is a that would be an interesting debate with many more people with a lot of different experiences and you know disciplinary backgrounds. And it goes down to the basic question, you know, how much money uh, of the scarce, scarce money that is available can be set aside for education, uh, you know, to start with. And I think that is a, uh, an important, crucial um, 
a crucial debate. Um, uh, so at the, at the level of the nation, I, I, I wouldn't dare to give you any advice, uh, but it deserves a, a good discussion. Uh, thank you, Guy. Then uh, maybe just a, a short remark that I don't want to withhold uh, from you, Guy, is from uh, Thea. She's saying that uh, IRC and SNP have developed some qualitative uh, monitoring instruments uh, to um, evaluate actually capacity development. And I know that in your extensive presentation, you discussed some others, but uh, could you say a few words about that? Uh, no, thank you very much for that uh, contribution. It, it, it's absolutely right. We do already have some uh, some uh, some frameworks, some some uh, sets of indicators that we should look at, and they are very useful. And, uh, of course, also again useful for certain arenas for water supply, rural sanitation, for you know uh, flood management. Um, uh, we need to continue to work on this. Uh, but as you rightly say, we already have uh, quite some valuable, workable uh, frameworks for that. Thank you, Guy. Then I uh, pulled two questions together and, and remarks, one of Caroline, another one of uh, Diana. Uh, one is uh, about uh, an example from donors uh, who are willing uh, to fund hand pumps, but not uh, small systems. And um, what she's saying is that we need to change their view that hand pumps is still in the solution in, in rural areas. Um, related to that is uh, the, the, the remark from Diana saying that political ability to steer cons conversations and insert issues on water investment agendas is central to increase changes for implementation. And I think both of those are indeed uh, quite important. And uh, again, uh, Guy, would you like to add to those remarks that uh, I think are indeed crucial for capacity development? Uh, I don't think I have much to add. These comments uh, are absolutely correct. And um, uh, what, what is definitely important is that, that we keep uh, putting the issue on the agenda. Uh, we should maybe not necessarily expect that immediately everybody will get very enthusiastic and put a lot of money in it. But the better our proposition on how the capacity development can be incorporated in programs, in policy preparation and implementation, um, the better we are able to demonstrate that there will be a measurable, quantifiable impact, uh, the more convincing we our story is going to be. And uh, as Diana also says, you know, we have to uh, always be around and, and put it on the agenda and keep working on that. Uh, then a an, an, uh, question from uh, Hank, and he's uh, saying that in the list of needs for capacity development, I missed the private sector. Is that not also an important sector? And I fully agree. Um, I, I don't think the list was uh, complete, uh, but uh, I fully agree that uh, the private sector plays an, a crucial role in there. I also think that uh, um, both maybe the private sector can learn things for the public sector, but that's also the other way around. And I think if you look at SDG 17, uh, there there's also a big push actually uh, to bring those two together and see how you can further improve uh, ODA uh, by also looking at, at trade. And I think there the engagement with the private sector is also, I think, uh, uh, quite important uh, to achieve uh, those uh, targets. Um, then a an, an question from Peter Kuki on culture, context specific and innovations, who determines what is an innovation? That's also a, a, a good question. I think there are quite some different uh, definitions in there. I think innovations are not just a, a technical innovation, an innovation is also how you can implement an innovation. So it also has a lot to do with culture and the social context of that. So I think that's a quite good uh, remark from, from Peter. Then uh, Zoltan is saying that, um, and that will be the last uh, question that we'll address here, is the level of um, capacity development strongly depends on the technical scientific level of the topic. For example, using high-tech tools has to focus on the individuals, and they will put the technology through to the institutions, etc. Maybe a, a, a short remark from your side on that one, Guy? Um, again, you know, capacity development has to be tailor made for the particular question at hand. And indeed, if we have a very uh, a very high technology type of innovation, sorry, Peter, for that, but if we have such a kind of innovation, you know, introducing IT, for example, 
then uh, definitely there will be much more need to have uh, individuals, staff, uh, but also through the education system in universities, uh, there will be a need to, to work more at the individual level for the individual education and training. But at the same time, also IT requires uh, organizational structures in order to make sure that the IT facilities are being properly uh, properly used and introduced. And that requires a change in the organizational structure. Um, but yes, so again, uh, definitely for certain types of, um, of challenges, we need to do more on the side of education and individual uh, capacity development. For others, it's more on the uh, organization or the enabling environment side. Thank you, Dee. And I think with that, uh, I would like to uh, end the, the question and answer, at least in, in, the, in the live session that we're now participating in. But I would also uh, invite you actually to continue uh, posing questions and we will uh, engage with you. And I would like to ask Anna if she could put the slide on the screen, how you can do this. And yes. while Anna is putting the slide on the screen, uh, I would like uh, already to thank both uh, yourself, the public, as well as, as Guy sitting here, but also Anna, our tech host, uh, for this uh, webinar. Please, Anna, can you explain a bit how people can stay engaged? Yes, so after this webinar, uh, the recording is going to be posted in Captev Symposium platform itself and also on YouTube. Um, to direct your questions uh, left open to the speakers, I would advise you to go to the post in the platform, in the conference platform itself, and post uh, and continue the conversations below in comments. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna. And uh, with that, again, um, I see some other quite nice questions, but we'll come back to that outside of this uh, symposium. I would like to thank you all, and I do hope to see you back in one of the other tracks or during the plenaries. I'm looking forward uh, to engage with you developing the Delft agenda for the capacity development in the water sector. Thank you very much, and see you next time.